everyone and let me just thank you so much for caring enough to come and worship with us on today. Listen, I'm gonna go right to the chase. I'm not gonna waste your time. I don't like people wasting my time. I'm not gonna waste yours. I'm so excited to have you worshiping with us. I'm so excited about the potential, the possibilities of what can come out of the time of celebration of worship on today. And I'm excited about the opportunity to be able to connect with you as we go forward. Throughout the celebration of worship, you'll see different information come on the screen that allows you to be able to engage with us so that we can re-engage with you. We want to stay connected. One of the things I tell the church is that in God, there are no accidents. In God, there are no coincidences. And in God, there are no happenstances. In God, there are only purposeful moments. And today is a purposeful moment. That's why I believe our paths have crossed today. You're about to enjoy a wonderful experience in God and I'm excited about it. Right before you do, I, I have to encourage you uh, to consider uh, purchasing my first book, Bloom Where God Has Planted You. It's time to fulfill your God-given purpose. We promote this book because it is chock full of information, scripture, resources, and even some personal testimonies that can help you along the path and journey of knowing your purpose and if there's anything that no matter where I go, wherever I travel all over the world, people ask, not because of me, but just ask in general is, what is my purpose? What is the purpose of life? Well, I can't promise all the answers, but I can promise to get you on the journey to discovering and even uncovering your purpose. The information on the screen, you can order the book, and I promise you, it will bless you. You may even want to get it for a small group discussion. Some churches have done that. Um, it will bless your small group as well. Now, having said that, let's get ready to go into the celebration of worship. The praise team is ready. The church is ready. And the word is ready also. Bless you. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to World Deliverance Christian Center Time of Worship. We thank you for joining us this morning. Let us know that you're worshiping with us by going and just typing in the word, check in to let us know that you're with us on this morning. We're going to have our Bible verse in our prayer. Isaiah 43. Now this is what the Lord says. He created you people of Jacob. He formed you people of Israel. He says, don't be afraid because I have saved you. I have called you by name and you are mine. Shall we pray? Lord God, we come right now just to say thank you. Lord, we thank you, God, for waking us up this morning, God, and allowing us to see this beautiful day, God, that you have created, God. Lord, I thank you for even allowing us to come together, God, and worship you on this day, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for your mighty and awesome word that will go forth on this day, God. We thank you because it will fall on early ground, God. We thank you, God, because we know that lives will be changed on this day and souls will be, the, will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Amen. 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 Amen.
WBCC, we have several ways that everyone can give. The first way is you can text your investment to 844-713-4622. Again, the number to text is 844-713-4622. Four six two two. If you'd like to give on our church website, you can log on to worlddeliveranceCC.net. Again, our church website address is worlddeliveranceCC.net. If you would like to mail in your investment, you can mail it to P.O. Box seven three five, Maywood, Illinois six zero one five three. Thank you and God bless. Hey, God bless you, and thank you so much for worshiping with us and for trusting us with your time. I so appreciate it. We so appreciate it. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your comments, your likes, your shares of our service. We appreciate uh, just your engaging with us. I'll be honest, as a pastor, I've never pastored through a pandemic, and I dare say you've never lived through a pandemic either. So it's new for all of us. Yet, one of the things that I fully believe is that this is one of the best times for the Church of Jesus Christ because it allows us to engage in uh, unprecedented ways. It allows us to reach unprecedented numbers of individuals. It allows us to be missional like God wants us to be missional. Also what it does though it is it allows uh, families, households to really begin to do again what Jesus instituted in terms of the Lord's Supper. As the priest of your house, if you are a follower of Christ, you are a priest in your house. So every day, you can take up the sacraments, the juice that represents the blood of Jesus, the wafer, the bread, the cracker, that represents the body of Jesus. And you can substitute juice for water or for soda or for orange juice, grape juice, grapefruit juice, whatever it is, if you don't have great juice itself, you can substitute it for that because it is symbolic of his blood. It is symbolic of his body. Yet, what I want to do is invite all of you in Chicago area who desire definitely world deliverance, but then others who desire to meet us on the first Sunday of July, next Sunday, at our place of worship for drive-through communion. 12 o'clock noon, next Sunday, we're going to have drive through communion. We're going to line up on Butterfield. We're located on the corner of Butterfield and Bowling. We're going to line up facing east. That's on that southeast corner where our location is. And we're going to stand near the parking lot and you drive by receive what's called a remembrance cup in it. It has the wafer and the juice. You'll be able to take communion. So after worshiping with us, we're going to have worship right here online next week. But then afterwards, meet us 12 o'clock noon, 439 Bowling in Bellwood for drive through communion. I look forward to seeing you and celebrating the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus with you.
Thank you for worshiping with us on today. On today, we'll be continuing in our series, Things I Wish the Church Would Talk About. This is a series where you all was able to pose questions to us, and during this time, we answer those questions. Today, the question will be, what happens after death? Our scripture will be coming from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. The Bible says, The Lord God put the man in the garden of Eden to care for it and work it. The Lord God commanded him, You may eat the fruit from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat the fruit from the tree which gives the knowledge of good and evil. If you ever eat fruit from that tree, you will die. God's word is already blessed and so are we. So I speak today from this thought. What happens after death? Hey, son. Hey. What, you TikToking? Yep. Oh, okay, well, it's time for bed, man. Okay. Good night. Good night, man. I love you. Love you, too. Hey, son, ain't you forgetting something? What? You gotta say your prayers before you go to sleep. Oh, yeah. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. Good night, man. Good night. So when I was a child, I was taught to pray that prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. At some point, um, I believe most children, including myself, stop saying that prayer. Whether it be from fear of thinking about death, death whether it be um, you just were saying something, really didn't understand what it meant, or you came to a point where you matured and did understand uh, what you were saying. Death is nothing to fear, and there is no reason to pray. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, because the fact of the matter is, the first thing we see in our text is death is not mysterious. Mm-hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, and verse 8. I'll be reading to you all from the NCV version. The Bible says, We know that our body, the tent we live in here on earth, will be destroyed. But when that happens, God will have a house for us. It will not be a house made by human hands. Instead, it will be a home in heaven that will last forever. But now we've grown in this tent. We want God to give us our heavenly home. Verse 8, so I say that we have courage. We really want to be away from this body and be at home with the Lord. Here in verse 1, we see where the Apostle Paul contrasts our earthly bodies, which is the tent we live in, and our future glorified resurrection bodies, which is the house that God has for us that's not made by hands. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that our earthly bodies are temporary. They are not permanent. While our glorified resurrection bodies will last and live forever. We saw in the intro an example of a child praying, If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. There is no reason for us to pray that the Lord take our souls because at death, the spirit of the believer immediately enters into the presence of God. Those who have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior can be confident confident in knowing that when they die, they will enter in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Let's take a look at um, Luke. If you all have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 23, starting at verse 39. And again, I'll be reading from NCV. Verse 39 says, One of the criminals on a cross 
began to shout insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Then save yourself and us. But the other criminal stopped him and said, you should fear God. You are getting the same punishment he is. We are punished justly, getting what we deserve for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. So some may, someone may be wondering on today that's out there worshiping with us on today. What happens at the very moment of death? What happens if I was to die right now? If you want to know the answer in one sentence, then here it is. What happens when you die depends on what happens before you die. I'll say that again. What happens when you die depends on what happens before you die. Now keep that in mind. Remember that. The Bible classifies the whole human race into two broad categories. Those categories are the saved and the lost. That's it. The saved are those who have trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. The lost are those who have not. What happens to the saved is completely different from, from what happens to those that are lost. For the saved, the Bible is abundantly clear that it's, uh, on some point when the saved die, they go directly into the presence of the Lord. At this point, we remember the words of Jesus to the thief we just read that was on the cross. He said, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise, which was Luke 23, 43. This appears to be a straightforward promise that at the moment of death, this repentant thief, and the key word I want you to hear here is repentant. Mm. He will pass from his life of crime and his agonizing death into the realm called paradise. Now let me put a pen in it right there and encourage someone on today. Even if, even in the wrong that we have done, even in the, and believe me, all of us have did something wrong. Everyone, we still continue to do, do things that are wrong. We all have sinned. We all have missed the mark. We have fell short of God's glory and his standard. And that's according to his word in Romans 3.23. But we too, just like this criminal who repented and would spend eternity with Jesus, are made the same promise. We are made the same promise. Yes. At the moment of death, the believer passes immediately into the personal presence of Jesus Christ. This is our hope. Those that believe, those that have confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, this is our hope. This is our confidence. And that we know for a fact that when we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we will spend eternity with him. There is, there is one similarity between what happens when the one saved dies and the one that lost dies. The similarity is that they both are buried and they both are placed into a grave. Mm. And then they both enter into a new realm. For the believer, though, we have already stated that the moment of death brings them into the personal presence of Christ. For the unbeliever, death brings or begins an experience for them of unending conscious punishment. Unending conscious punishment. Wow. Just think about that. For something to be a punishment, but it's unending. And unconscious means that you're fully aware of what's taking place. You're conscious. You can feel it. It never ends. Mm. Who who want to go through that? No one want to go through that. We'll go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3. Verse 2 and 3. But now we groan in this tent. Now here we're not talking about, you know, necessarily complaining, but we're talking about seeking um, by faith that which is to come. You know, there's a longing that's, that's taking place we, we want to give us, we want God to give us our heavenly home. You know, when, have, have, have you ever had, you know, a gift or you had a birthday coming, right? And you got wind of something that good, your, your, someone was giving you. And the anticipation is just so great. You can't wait. You just like, oh my God, this gift is going to be so awesome. I, I've been waiting for this. This is how believers feel. Yes, this is yes. how we should feel. We anticipate that great day when 
when, when Jesus come back for his church. We anticipate that day when God give us that house that's not made by man's hands. Yes. In verse three, and why and why why do we anticipate that, that house that God only can give us? Because in verse three it says it will clothe us so we will not be naked. So we, we won't be just spirits roaming around. We'll be we'll have bodies. Hmm. We'll have new bodies. And, and guess what? What's gonna be about them bodies that's different than the bodies we have now? They're gonna be perfect. Perfect. I don't know about you all, but for me, that's hope. Yes. For me, I have confidence because I look forward to having that perfect body. My body right now, it ain't perfect. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, my back don't want to work, legs want to give out and well, hurt, but this body is perfect. 2 Corinthians, going down a little further to verse 8 in that same chapter 5. Yes. It says, so I say that we have courage. We really want to be away from this body and be home with the Lord. Now I'm going to read it to you again in, in the New King James Version because most of us used to hearing it this way. We are confident, yes, well pleased to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Why should we be confident? We, hear, we see here that we should be confident. Why is that? Because if we have trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we can be confident and not afraid because we have the assurance of spending eternity with Christ. Of course, facing the unknown may cause anxiety for some, and the Bible even speaks against that. You know, the Bible tells us we don't have to be anxious. It actually says be careful. We don't have to be careful or anxious for anything. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, they lose loved ones. We have a lot of people who lost loved ones this year due, due to everything that's been going on. But, you know, the fact of the matter is if we believe Christ, had, if we believe in Christ and confess him as our Lord and Savior, we can share the hope and confidence we see Paul have here for eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, this is how I want you all to look at death. Look at death like this. Death is only a prelude to eternal life with God. Mm. Death is only a prelude. What's a prelude? The prelude is something that takes place before something that will show you what's to come and also lets you see, you know, what it is you're moving toward. Yes. Now, let's look at an example of this in the Word. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55, 56, and 59. The Bible says, but Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at God's right side. Now, here I want you to understand something. Stephen saw something that was immediately seized, that immediately seized his attention. Mm -hmm. He saw something was like, oh man, he paid attention to it. And what was that? That was God's glory that he saw. Mm -hmm. The throne of God. It say that he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, what's significant here, and I don't want you to miss this, is that the word said that Jesus was standing on the right hand of God. Now, normally in scripture, Jesus is presented as sitting at the right hand of God. But let me share with you a few scriptures. Hebrews 1 and 3. The sun reflects the glory of God and shows exactly what God is like. He holds everything together with his powerful word. When the sun made people clean from their sins, he did what? He sat down at the right side of God, the great one in heaven. Okay. Mark 16, 19. After the Lord Jesus said these things to his followers, he was carried up into heaven and he sat down at the right side of God. Luke twenty two sixty nine. 69. But from now on, the son of man will sit, sit, at the right hand of, of the powerful God. Matthew 26, 6, 4. Jesus answered, Those are your words, but I tell you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. Now, go with me. Stay with me. All right. The powerful one and coming on the clouds in the sky. Acts 2, 34. 
David was not the one who was lifted up to heaven, but he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit by my right side. Now, prior to reading these scriptures, I said that Jesus is usually presented as sitting at the right hand of God. But here in Acts 7, 7 55, it said that Jesus was standing. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not standing out of anxiety of what was about to happen to Stephen. He wasn't standing because he was scared of what was about to take place. But instead, he was standing as to welcome his faithful servant home. Wow. Wow. See, he they say he, he, he was looking up. He saw the glory of God. So he's like, oh, my God, that's my servant. I don't even see what's taking place. Do y'all know that sometimes God would allow some things because he know at the end of it all, you coming home to be with him. Mm. We should be confident knowing that when we die, Jesus is standing. Mm. He's standing, ready to welcome you, welcome to welcome me. Anyone who has confessed Jesus, the Lord, and say he's standing, ready to welcome you home. Acts 7, 56. He said, look, now we, going back to Acts, what we're talking about, Stephen. And this is Stephen saying, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at God's right hand or right side. Verse 59, while they were throwing stones. Mm. They stoning this man, y'all. While they were throwing stones, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. As he's being stoned, as this man is being killed, while he stood being stoned to death, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. How, how could Stephen be so peaceful mm. down without putting up a fight? How many of us, man, we would have been throwing hands? <laughs> but Stephen was peaceful. He, didn't, he was down without putting up a fight. How could Stephen be so peaceful dying without lashing out? How could Stephen be so peaceful dying? But then if we look at that next scripture, which is verse 60, it tells us that he cried out to God saying, Oh Lord, don't hold this against these guys. Mm -hmm. In the midst of them killing him, he kept, he kept his peace. And even asked the Lord, Lord, don't, 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 don't hold this against them. My God, my God. Wow. Because Stephen knew that God had a place prepared for him. See, when you know that God got a place, a place prepared for you, you can keep peace at all times. Yes, yes, yes. Because it's only in him that peace comes, the real peace. Because God will give you that peace that passes all understanding. Stephen knew at this time that when he left there, he was going home to be with the Lord. He could say, Lord, receive my spirit. Because he knew at the exact moment he took his last breath, he knew exactly where he was going. The second thing we see in our text on today is death is imminent. Yes. What does that mean? It is close. It's near. It's approaching. It's on the way. It's coming. Hebrews 9, 27 in the New King James Version reads as follows. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. The appointment of death of man or woman to die once is due to the fall of man in Genesis 3 and 6. Mm -hmm. And at that point, all men were under the sentence of death and separated from God. And, that, and if you can go back and read that on your own time, Genesis 3 and 6. But in the beginning of this sermon, we read Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17, where God told Adam, you know, you can eat of any tree, but... Don't touch that tree of knowledge of good and evil. But then in 3 and 6, Adam did exactly what God told him not to do. How many, how many um, know that judgment, you know, just like death, judgment is not a popular topic of discussing during the time in which we live. Well. But the Bible teaches that judges is come, judgment is coming. Yes. We just read it in Hebrews 9.27. And as I stated earlier, but bears repeating, what happens after you die depends on what happens before you die. Mm -hmm. We just read the Bible, Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. How many of you have had an appointment of some sort 
and you just didn't make it due to mismanage your time. Or perhaps you had an appointment that you really didn't want to go to. Hmm. You know, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to be honest, I've had both. I've had appointments where it was like, hey, you know, I lost track of time. I didn't make it. And then there's some times, honestly, I just be like, you know what? I ain't feeling this today. So I'm not going. Well, I want to hear, want you to hear me and hear me well. This is an appointment that no one would miss. You can't miss this. If someone once noted the statistics of death are appalling. Have any of you heard this, the, the statistics on death lately? If you haven't, I'll share them with you. The statistics on death is 100 out of 100 people will eventually die. Wow, wow. 100 out of 100 will eventually die. We are all terminally ill with a disease called death. We just don't know when the end will come. Knowing that it is appointed for us to die once during the judgment, I want to ask you this question. Do you look forward to Christ's return? Or do you see Christ's return as a threat? Hmm. And I want you to seriously think about that, that question. Do you look forward to Christ's return? Or do you see Christ's return as a threat? And if you see Christ's return as a threat, I, 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 I implore you on today to get your life together and get a right relationship with God. Yes, yes. Because yes. knowing that Christ is coming back for his church should not be a threat to those that love him because he loves us and we know that we will spend eternity with him. As sure as death itself is coming one day, so is judgment. Let's remember that. How many of you have ever had a run in with the law? Mm. Whether it be criminal, civil, traffic tickets, whatever other thing you can go to court for or be in trouble for. I've had some. My most challenging time in court was when my children were younger and I got caught driving my youngest child um, in my moving car without him being in his car seat. I knew it was wrong to have my child in his car seat without him in his car seat, but I really didn't understand how, how serious of an offense it would be. So I got pulled over. They, you know, give me a ticket. I go to court sometime later. And when I go to court, the judge called me up, Mr. Bonner, what's your reason for having your son in a moving vehicle with out of car seat? Don't you know it's the law to have little children in a car seat? I say, yes, your honor. I'm aware of what the law says. And I take full responsibility for not having him in a car seat. And honestly, your honor, I don't have a reason to give you because I knew better. So at that point, I thought, you know, I'm good. I'm good. Man, this judge went off in front of everybody in the courtroom. And he might as well have said, because he was alluding to it, we should just go ahead and take you into custody. Mm. This guy was so serious about me putting the life of my child in danger by not having him in a car seat. But then I had a person standing next to me. Some people had a public defender. Some people had their own attorney. But I had a person there to fight for me. I had a person there that was there to represent me. He told the judge, you know what, judge? He's never had an offense, offense like this before. This is the first that he's had on his record. You know, why don't we give him another chance? Mm. The, the, the judge really wasn't trying to hear what he was talking about because the judge was highly upset with me. But the judge went on and said, okay, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. So, you know, after some stiff fines, some probation, you know, um, and it's just that stern talking to, you know, I was, I was released and just had to fulfill what the, what the court had said. Mm. But then prior to leaving, the judge says, you know, you have 30 days to appeal my decision. In writing, if you think you don't, if you think the verdict I rendered on you is unfair or unjust or whatever the case may be, then you have 30 days to appeal what I said. Let me tell you all something. I said that to say this. At God's judgment, there would be no higher court of appeal. Wow. Should the verdict be not to your liking. The judgment is final. 
If you hope for a verdict in your, in your favor in God's court, you better put your hope solely on Jesus. In Jesus, we have freedom and have been pardoned from our sin. With Jesus, we are found not guilty. We can rejoice now knowing that God's judgment of us is not based on what we did. It's not based on, on that, but instead it's based on his judgment of the, the what his son did for us. Yes, yes. The perfect life of his son, Jesus. The last thing we'll see in our text, death is not the end. A lot of people, I, I don't know about you all, I, I coming up, I used to hear this saying, um, when you're dead, you're done. That's it. Death is not the end, no. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 51 through 55, the Bible says, but look, I tell you this secret. We will not all sleep in death, but we will all be changed. It will take only a second, as quickly as an eye blinks, when the last trumpet sounds. The trumpet will sound and those who have died will be raised to live forever and we will all be changed. This body that can be, destro be destroyed must clothe itself with something that can never be destroyed and this body that dies must clothe itself with something that can never die. So this body that can be destroyed will clothe itself with that which cannot be destroyed and this body that dies will clothe itself with that which can never die. When this happens, the scripture will be made true. Death is destroyed forever in victory. That's a quote from Old Testament, Isaiah 25 and 8. Mm -hmm. Verse 55, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your pain? From the NCV version. That's also a quote from the Old Testament, Hosea 13 and 14. So we, we see, you know, this has been already talked about even before this time. The moment a saint dies, our body ceases to live until it's re resurrected in, in the perfect uh, rapture. First, we see in this in 1 Corinthians. Now, the word rapture means the transformation and catching up of all those who have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, whether dead or alive, to meet Christ in the air. For more on that, you can look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which was preached three weeks ago by executive pastor bill. Now our soul, which is our mind, our will, our intellect ceases to exist. And our spirit goes back to the Lord. As Tony Evans says, have a good time at my funeral. Cause I won't be there. <laughs> when we go to funerals, the people are not there. You just see the body, the vessel that God allowed them to use while they were here. Earlier, we talked about what happened after death to those who are saved. Those that have repented and confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And let me tell you what's in store for those that are lost and those that never repented and confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The moment the lost, those without Jesus die, they go to hell. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to talk about, but we live in a day and age, we got to tell the truth. We can't sugarcoat things. You leave this earth without knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell. Because why? You got... People that's saved going to heaven, you got people who unsaved going to hell. And the fact of the matter is, everybody got to be somewhere all the time. You got to be somewhere. So if you're not at one place, you're at the other place. But you got to be somewhere. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus um, talked about this rich man. And um, he went to hell and, and suffered torment. And while this rich man was here on earth, man, this um, this guy, I'm sorry, was living big, dressing nice, you know. But then he had had the finest meals, and it was this guy named Lazarus who would sleep or, or stay outside this guy's gate. And Lazarus had sores on him and all that kind of stuff. And this rich man wouldn't do nothing for him. So eventually the time comes where Lazarus dies. And the rich man dies. And the Bible says the angels carried Lazarus to, to Abraham. Now, they both see each other. And reminder that the rich man is in hell. Hmm. He's telling Abraham, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Abraham like, nothing I can do. 
you had your chance to make your decision. And you and you chose to live high on the hall and, and not, not even trust who Jesus was, not to help anyone. You had a man sitting outside your gate. You just left him there. Let him let the dogs come and lick on his sores. That's, that's what the Bible says. So then the, the rich man tells him, Well, just let Lazarus come and put a drop of water or something in my mouth. It's hot. Hell is hot. <laughs> in the event that you think is not, hell is hot. And, you know, he said, No, that we can't do that. So then now he's like, You know what? Man, you know, this is real. You know, I this I wouldn't I wouldn't wish this on nobody. Hey, can you send Lazarus back and, and let him go to my father's house? And why why do you want to go to his father's house? Because he said, I got five brothers. And I want them to be told that, hey, do whatever you gotta do. Don't come here. Don't come here. He said, No, no, we can't let him go back to do that. We ain't gonna let him go back and talk. He said, but I, I really want them to know and understand. That this is not a place you want to be. Yeah, yeah. You know, we hear things about hell. Oh, this is your hell, heaven and hell right here. It's not. It's not. People sometimes say it's hot as H E double hockey sticks out here. It's not. <laughs> no matter how hot it gets, it can be 115. It still ain't hot as that. So he was pleading, please let, let Lazarus go back and tell my brothers, because I just don't want nobody I love to come here. He said, no, we're we not going to send them back. They got, they got the teachers of Moses. They got what the prophets have said. And, and, and the simple fact of the matter is, me bringing somebody back from the dead to tell somebody about hell, it's not going to change their decision. It's not going to change what they decide. They have what they need. We have what we need. We have the answer to avoid going to their place. Yes. We don't need anybody from the dead to come tell us how hot hell is because his word tells us. And what what, what do we see here in, in this? We see that the lost have eternal punishment. Eternal. Eternal a long time, y'all. Eternal is forever. Remember I mentioned earlier unending conscious punishment? That's what this is. It never ends. You ain't saw pain. You ain't felt heat. You out there and it's, it's no turning back. We get we get chance after chance while we're here. God gives us opportunity after opportunity after, after opportunity. And we got to take advantage of opportunity before it's too late. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 48, the Bible says, if your hand causes you to sin, Cut it off. Yeah, yeah. It is better for you to lose part of your body and live forever than to have two hands and go to hell. I want y'all to hear this now. Where the, where the fire never goes out. 44. In hell the worm dies. The worm does not die. The fire is never put out. 45. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to lose part of your body and to live forever than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. In hell, the worm does not die. The fire never is put out. If your eye causes you to sin, take it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. In hell, the worm does not die. The fire is never put out. I don't know what else got to be said, you all. To show that hell is not a place you want to go. Hell is not a place you want to go, you all. The bodies of the lost will be re will be reunited with their spirit to be punished. For those who fail to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, the Bible says, Then I saw a great white throne, and the one who was sitting on it, earth and sky ran away from him and disappeared. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the house, the throne. Then books were open, and the book of life was open. The dead were judged by what they had done, which was written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. 
Each person was judged by what they had done. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. The word tells us that the lost will be thrown into the lake of fire. Fire and brimstone wear now not only where you will be if you don't accept Jesus Christ, but Satan's going to be there. His M's going to be there. Hell itself will be there to burn forever and ever. People do not void hell because we refuse to believe that it exists. Mm. People don't avoid hell because those of us who were saved love the person that was unsaved. It just don't work like that. They avoid hell by accepting Jesus. That's the only way you can avoid it. If we truly love them, I mean really, 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 really love people, we should want them to be saved. Some think that they will have no courage, but just before death, God gives an immense amount of courage and grace to face what is next with confidence. Hmm. That's the truth. That's God's word. I'll leave you with this. 1 Corinthians, we just read these two scriptures, verse chapter 15, verse 54 and 55, but I'm going to read it to you in the King James Version. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall he be then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Yes. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I read a, a story, and it's by a guy named John Corson. And um, a little girl was having a picnic with, with her daddy. Deathly, deathly allergic to bee stings, she became terrified because there was a bee buzzing over the top of, uh, top of her head. Seeing the bee, her father caught it because he knew that if, if this bee stings her, it can be detrimental to her, and this little girl knows the same thing. He sees the bee. Her father caught it. He held it in his hand for a few seconds. And then after he held it in a few seconds, he let the bee go. After he let the bee go, the daughter says, Daddy, Daddy, what are you doing? The bee is going to sting me. Mm. Instead of him explaining to his daughter what happened, he opened his hand and saw where the bee had stumbled. Mm -hmm. The sting was left in his hand. That's what that's precisely and exactly what Jesus did for me, for you, for everyone. When he went to the cross, he absorbed our sin. Yeah. He took the sting of death. He absorbed everything where we didn't have to, we didn't have to deal with it. Sin was forever atoned at the cross which took away the sting of death. Some may have believed by, that the enemy was victorious in the Garden of Eden, back in Genesis chapter 3. Some may have believed that the enemy was uh, victorious at the cross of Jesus. Some may have thought, or is currently thinking that the enemy is current, or uh, the enemy is victorious in your current situation. Mm. You may have thought that the enemy was victorious in your past situations. But I, I, I stand here and I encourage you right now that death, to let you know death has been defeated. Yes. It has been defeated. Jesus overcame it all and because of him, we will also. We have to be confident in that. Because death was swallowed up in victory, we can reap the full benefits of the cross. I give you our challenge for this week. The challenge is there are many in the world today that if they were to die right now, what they would find what happened after death would not be favorable to them mm. because of what they didn't do while they had the chance to. Wow. Intentionally ask five people, what do they think will happen to them after death? If they are not saved, share with them the benefits of accepting him that day and then invite them to worship with us on next week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, right now we come to tell you thank you. We thank you, God, for your word that went forth on today, God. We thank you, Lord, for everyone who tuned in to worship with us on today, God. 
We thank you, Lord, that we was able to address the question that someone posed, what happens after death? We thank you, Lord, that we was able to give an answer to that question according to your word. We thank you, Lord, right now that we know that what happens after death, God, is based on what we do before we die. God, so we pray, Lord, right now that you touch hearts right now. Draw people right now by your Holy Spirit. That people see, God, right now that they are in need of a Savior. And this is the only way, God, that they will not see hell. Lord, let them understand right now, God, that you love them so much that you gave your only begotten son for them, just for them. While we were yet not seeing God, you commended your love towards us, towards those that are worshiping with us on today. So let them recognize and realize, God, that you love them that much, God, that you won't do anything to hurt them. You don't want anyone to go to hell. That's why you provided us a way back to you through your son, Jesus. And we just thank you, Lord, for right now. We love you. We praise you, we honor you, we adore you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Right now we issue the call to new life. There may be someone out there who worship with us today who heard the message and say, I don't want to be one of those that, that's eternally separated from God. You may have heard the story of the rich man and don't want to be that person that's on the other side of the pit. Wishing, oh my God, I wish I had one more chance. We set this time aside for you right now. If you have not come to a place in your life where, where you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can just follow the directions on the screen. We leave this time for you right now for those who may be in need of prayer. If you're in need of prayer, we have somebody ready and willing right now to pray with you. Just call the number right on the screen. Someone to answer and pray with you about whatever you need to pray for. Some may, someone may be watching and you don't have a church home. Right now, we're currently not in the building, but that's okay. You can still join us and be a disciple at Word and Christian Center. All you have to do is just follow the instruction on the screen. The Word tells us that all we have to do is confess and believe Hallelujah. that Jesus died and rose again. Hallelujah. And if you want to make that decision today, this is the time. We have people that will, as soon as you put, put in, call their number, text their number, they will contact you and have a discussion with you. They have a conversation with you. And they will definitely talk to you about the decision that you're trying to make. What a word, what a word. Thank you so much again for watching. I really appreciate it. And hopefully, as I promised, it did not waste your time. Matter of fact, it added value to your life. Again, don't forget, as we said, you get us in Christ. You can join us uh, for any time that we have in worship. You can support us as we bless others. And also, remember, the first book right here, the one where God has planted you. It's time to fulfill your God given purpose. You can go to our website, click on the link, and be able to get yours even right away. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.